Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time around I'm going to flirt with danger and compare the Nikon Z9 to the Sony A1. As someone who shoots both and is heavily invested in both, I'm constantly asked which is better for wildlife work, and I actually will declare who I think is the winner at the end of this video. Also, please note that this is not intended to be a comprehensive overview of every single feature between the two cameras. That would take hours. Think of this video as a comparison summary of the main features that I think wildlife and nature photographers are the most interested in. Finally, if you enjoy videos like this, let me know with a subscribe and a like, and I'll keep them coming. Let's take a look. Size, weight, and ruggedness. First we have size and weight, and the winner for this category depends on your needs. If you need a lighter, smaller camera, then the A1 is the best choice. If you prefer a large, robust body with an integral grip, the Z9 has your back. I find camera size preference varies wildly from user to user, so I think only you can decide which camera would suit your needs best. For me, I can go either way, although I find the smaller size of the A1 handy when traveling overseas. I like the option to have the grip on or off as needed, although at the same time, you know, there's just something about that building grip on the Z9 that just feels so good in your hand. As for durability, it feels like the Z9 would be more rugged than the A1 under extreme conditions. However, I'm not sure that's 100% accurate or fair. I've had both cameras in rain, snow, dust, and both have been beaten and bounced all over the place, and both work just fine. In fact, the A1 has actually taken more abuse since I've had it longer. So, in all honesty, I can't personally say which is more rugged since both have been flawless from a hardware standpoint. Now, I have had some lockups with the Z9 that required a battery pull to fix, but those have been few and far between. But as a side note, the A1 has never locked up on me, despite more use and abuse than the Z9. And yes, I actually have had a lockup with the current 3.01 firmware and the Z9. Controls, ergonomics, and features. This is another area where there isn't a decisive answer as to which camera is better. Both cameras feature a multitude of controls and buttons, and both place them within easy reach for most hands. I find both cameras comfortable to hold for hours on end. However, I know that some people find the Z9 too large to comfortably handle, and others find the A1 too small, especially between the lens and the grip. In this case, the camera that's most comfortable to you probably comes down to the size of your hand more than anything else. From a control standpoint, I think the A1 has an edge over the Z9. While the Z9 technically has more buttons to program, what you can do with them is somewhat limited compared to the A1. I often find with the Z9 that I simply can't program the function I need to a given button, where that's usually not a problem with the A1. In addition, the A1 also has a handy exposure compensation dial on the top that I use all the time, and I find much handier than the push and turn method the Z9 uses. In addition, the A1 also has a handy control wheel on the back that I can program as needed, and that control wheel has three programmable button positions too, along with the center button. Now, I think that guy kind of missed an opportunity here. There's a lot of blank real estate on the top of the Z9 that would have been a good spot for some sort of customizable wheel, and I wonder if they could have done something similar to what Sony has done with their multi-selector as well, making it maybe even a little bit more useful. Oh, and although it's a small thing, the joystick on the A1 is much nicer to push in, even with the Prefer Subselector Center option enabled on the Z9. Now, you may be thinking that although the Z9 doesn't maybe have the same variety of controls on the body as the A1, the lenses certainly do, and those lenses are more customizable than their Sony counterparts. And all that's true. But the problem is that not every lens has every control. So if I program something to a lens button, control ring, or function ring that's not on all my lenses, it can be frustrating in the field, and I have to work around it. With the A1, I can program everything I need right to the controls on the camera body and always have those features on tap regardless of what lens is attached to the camera. What about startup time? Now, that's not even a contest. The Z9 starts almost instantly. Although the A1 isn't sluggish, the couple of seconds it can take to turn on has cost me shots. The Z9 is ready at DSLR-like speed. Then there's a sensor cover. The Z9 has a dedicated sensor cover where the A1 uses its shutter. Although both are effective at keeping out dust, the Nikon is more rugged and I'm more comfortable with it exposed than the shutter on the Sony. In addition, the Nikon shield is up and down as fast as the camera turns on or off. With the Sony, it takes a moment longer. This means when you want to change your lens or add a TC, you have to wait a few precious seconds before the shutter is closed, seconds that can cost shots. 
I often find myself not waiting for the shutter when I'm in a hurry, so I'm more likely to get some dust on my sensor as a consequence. Going over to the car doors, and I know this seems really nitpicky, but the A1 has the edge here. The door on the Nikon, while not hard to open, isn't as quick and easy as the Sony. As for car types, this is going to boil down to preferences, I think. I prefer the CF Express Type B that the Z9 uses. They're cheaper, easier to find, faster, and have larger capacities. However, the CF Express Type A cards in the A1 are smaller, and the dual slot allows the camera to use either CF Express Type A cards or SD cards in both slots. So if you're in a pinch for a memory card, being able to use an SD card is handy. Still, I prefer the path Nikon took here. What about the viewfinders? Now this is close. The Z9 viewfinder is brighter, but the A1 viewfinder is better at making me forget I'm using an EVF. Both are close and both offer a blackout free shooting experience and both offer a fast enough frame rate to reduce lag to nearly zero. Although I find at really slow shutter speeds when I'm panning, it's a little bit easier with the Z9. On the other hand, the little rubber gasket around the viewfinder loves to pop off of my Z9, so it's a give and take. Still, I'm perfectly happy with either one. Then we have the flip screens. Well, the Z9 wins here for sure, since it tips out both vertically and horizontally, where the A1 is only horizontal. Although I don't use the vertical option all the time, I use it enough to miss it when I shoot the A1. Next we have what I like to call exposure helpers. The Z9 has a live histogram, but the zebra stripes in the Sony are far handier in my opinion, since they sort of act like live blinkies if you're clipping highlights. They're much more obvious during intense shooting than the histogram, which is pretty easy to overlook, especially if there's only a small bit of clipping. How about the batteries? Well, I did a few tests. I set the cameras as shown in this slide. I basically adjusted them so they were set as close to each other as possible. I had the standby timer set to never shut off and I put a little piece of tape over the eye sensors on the EVF so that it stayed on the entire time. I also wanted to knock out some shots with the camera, so I decided that 10 times an hour sounded about right, so I shot about 120 photos with each camera at six minute intervals. The results? Well, it kind of depends on how you look at it. The Z9 lasted a total of four hours and 23 minutes with a fully charged battery in my test. The A1 lasted two hours and 52 minutes with a single battery. So the Z9 has a big advantage here. However, if you have a grip on the A1 like I do, that puts two batteries in the camera. So if you use an A1 with a battery grip and two freshly charged batteries, you get a total of five hours and 45 minutes of continuous time in my test an hour and 20 minutes more than with the Z9. The smaller batteries also have an advantage while charging. The A1 batteries charge from a fully dead state in about two hours and five minutes. The Z9 from the same dead state takes about three and a half hours to fully charge. Now, if you only have a single charger, then the Z9 gets you back to shooting faster than trying to charge two A1 batteries. However, if you have a pair of chargers for the Sony, then you'll be fully charged in roughly an hour and a half less than the Z9. Finally, frame rate and buffer. Although both cameras can go 30 frames per second, the A1 has the advantage here as it can do it with compressed RAW, where the Z9 is JPEG only. However, I keep them both at 20 frames per second so I can shoot the best quality, lossless RAW files. Buffer is in the 80 frame range or so for either camera shooting lossless compressed RAW, something I think that both could improve upon. In my opinion, a flagship camera should be able to go at least 10 seconds at the best file quality. Both the Z9 and the A1 have full buffers in less than half of that time. The good news is that both can still shoot at a decent frame rate even with a full buffer, so it's usually not a tragedy if you hit it. Also, yes, I know I can use the compressed RAW options and have an essentially endless buffer on both cameras, and I do go that route at times. I also know faster cards may help as time goes on. Still, I think the camera should have a deeper buffer right out of the gate. Customization. Both cameras offer a wide array of customizations. In fact, if you're not used to pro bodies, the sheer number of customizations is overwhelming. However, the Sony A1 easily wins this round. When it comes to programming your buttons and dials and wheels, the A1 has nearly 100 more choices than the Z9, including options for shutting off subject detection, spot metering hold, toggling subject type for your subject detection, and many others you won't find on a Z9. Not only does Sony offer a far more extensive list of options for button customization, they also seem to allow you to do more with each button. As I mentioned earlier, one frustrating thing with the Z9 is that Nikon severely limits the functions you can program to many of the buttons. Now, 
For some functions, yeah, I get it. The buttons may be in a bad location for something you would typically call for from the viewfinder, as an example. But in other cases, there's little need to limit what options can be put on which buttons. Sony also offers three recall shooting options to Nikon's One. Plus, their user modes are more comprehensive than the Nikon photo shooting banks. Sony allows you to have three custom setups covering pretty much every setting in the camera with the notable exception of any camera controls you've customized, and you can set them right to the mode dial. Nikon's photo shooting banks only cover items in the photo shooting menu, but at least you can program a button to access them. Nikon also has custom setting banks, and unlike Sony, they do allow you to have different camera control setups from bank to bank. However, changing a custom settings bank isn't something you can program to a button. You can only change them via menus or the eye menu. Plus, photo shooting banks and custom setting banks don't link up. In addition, any changes you make in a Nikon bank while you're in it becomes the new default for that bank. When you switch from mode to mode in the Sony, you go back to your baseline for that mode, even if you made changes the last time you were in it. Now, this is a matter of preference, but I prefer going back to my baselines. That's why I set up the user modes in the first place. The bottom line with Sony's customization is that just about any configuration you can come up with is possible, and for me at least, it makes a difference in the field. I always feel very quick and nimble with the A1, and I think I'm a bit faster with it because of how I have it set up. However, don't read something into these comments that isn't there. The Z9, while not as customizable, is still very configurable. Although I think the A1's customizations make it more convenient to access some features, there's nothing there that I'm going to call a deal breaker. At this level, we're still comparing Lamborghinis and Ferraris. The good news is that it's much closer when it comes to like normal menu options. Both cameras offer a wide array of options and menu customizations that allow you to mold the camera into what you need it to be in the field. Also, a quick note about firmware. When the Z9 first came out, it was good, but lagging the A1 in quite a few areas. However, Nikon has been fantastic about issuing firmware updates and adding new features to the camera. It seems like anytime they have an idea for a new feature, the Z9 gets it, and sometimes the mid-range cameras do as well. On the other hand, Sony isn't as forthcoming with updates, and as it stands at the moment, some of their newer mid-range cameras have features the A1 doesn't. In time, the Z9 may very well become more feature-rich than the A1. Image quality. This is another area that's incredibly close, although I'm sure there are those who swear there are major differences between the two cameras. For my part, I have to look at the EXIF data to really figure out which camera I used. It's that close. Also, while the A1 is higher resolution than the Z9, from a practical standpoint, it really doesn't seem to make any difference. Still, let's jump into Lightroom and take a look at some color and ISO comparisons. Okay, so here's our first color comparison. We have the A1 on the left, the Z9 on the right, and both are at ISO 100. If you notice, the A1 does seem to have a little bit more vibrancy in the colors than the Z9 does. The Z9s are a little bit more neutral, and depending on your preference, you're going to like one or the other maybe a little bit better. If you like your colors a little more vibrant out of the box, then the A1 has the edge here. If you want them a little more neutral, the Z9 has the edge, and a little more neutral is usually what I want. However, they are so close, I can make either one of these look like the other one in a very short amount of time inside of Lightroom. So for me, how the camera renders color is about the last thing I'd worry about when I'm trying to decide between grabbing my A1 or my Z9. They're both very, very close, and both of the RAW files are very malleable. It's very easy to adjust them, so not a big deal here. I do notice that the Z9 files have a little bit more, if you look at the neutrals here, there's slightly more cyan here, and this is slightly maybe more magenta over here. So again, it just depends on the rendering and how you like it. And again, all of this is very, very easy to adjust in Lightroom with the RAW file. So, uh, yeah, I think this is kind of a wash. Now, there is another aspect, though, to color, and that is how does it hold up at higher ISOs? So let's take a look at that. Let's go to the 12,800 version of this shot with the A1 and kind of compare those two. And as you can see, the color fidelity goes down slightly, but it's still very, very close. Let's take a look at the Nikon. And in this case, we see the same thing. The color fidelity goes down slightly, but it does hold onto the color really, really well. So both cameras, I'm not afraid, from a color standpoint at least, to shoot at something like 12,800. So I think they both did a really good job here. And as a side note, this isn't just an academic comparison of color swatches. What we're seeing in these comparisons and what I'm telling you is exactly what I see when I'm post-processing real live RAW files from either camera. 
Next, let's do some ISO comparisons. And for these comparisons, I converted everything to black and white. So those little color differences that we saw aren't gonna interfere. And let's just zoom in. We're gonna start at 3200. And this is a 100% view. And as you can see, it is incredibly close across the board between these two cameras. And spoiler alert, that's going to kind of be the theme here. So that's 3200. Both of them look about the same to me. Next, let's go to 6400. Here we are at 6400. Once again, we'll zoom in. And once again, it is very close. Once again, the A1 is on the left, the Z9 on the right. And to me, these look nearly identical. If there's a difference, it's a tenth of a stop, and I'm not even sure which camera has the advantage. It kind of depends on which color swatch you're looking at. So both of them, again, very, very close. Let's take a look at 12,800. So let's go ahead and zoom into our 12,800s and take a look. And Big surprise, I sure hope you were sitting down for this. They're about the same. There's just not a big significant difference between the ISOs on either of these cameras. And again, it seems to vary depending on which color the swatch is that you're looking at. And it's very, very minor variances there. So there we go. As a side note, I'm frequently asked, what's my maximum ISO for both the A1 and the Z9? For the most part, I like to keep things under ISO 3200 when I can. However, I will jump to ISO 6400 if I'm filling the frame and the image isn't going to require a significant crop. I will play with ISOs in the 12,800 range as well, but typically that's a circumstance where I'm not planning to crop and I'm shooting the kind of image where noise reduction is going to work really well. As a side note, if you don't know why cropping makes a difference in ISO choice, see my video titled, Does Cropping Make Your Photos Noisy? Before we get to autofocus, I wanted to mention that no matter which of these two cameras you use, you absolutely must learn how to set them up properly if you want to realize their full potential. To that end, I have two books that will take you step by step through my setups for each camera. Now, I don't just show you how I set my menus and controls, I tell you why I use a particular setup and how I use it in the field. I used the setups described in these books for all the photos you've seen in this video. If you want to get the most from your Z9 or A1, you owe it to yourself to check it out of the site. Autofocus. Ah, the one you've been waiting for, right? Well, this segment is going to be shorter than you might expect. Although I'd love to pick a winner here, I just can't. With each camera running the current firmware, they both seem equally tenacious when it comes to finding, grabbing, and holding onto a subject. Both normal AF and AF with subject detection is fantastic in either camera. Although it is nice that the Nikon Z9's animal setting covers both birds and mammals, where the A1 requires you to switch between bird and animal. In the field, my wife and I have been shooting both systems side by side, comparing notes and swapping gear. In every case, we're both seeing consistent success with both cameras. Naturally, we can't try every animal, and in some specific cases, the A1 seems to have a slight edge, and in other cases, the Z9 does, but it's always very close, at least with the targets we've been photographing. And that's the key here. I'm sure there are scenarios where one camera may have a significant noticeable advantage over the other. I just haven't stumbled upon it yet with the current firmware. The truth is, this time of year, I don't get out and shoot as much as I'd like, and the subject matter is sort of limited where I live. Still, from what we've experienced so far, both camera systems seem to be very close in AF performance. Both AF systems are robust and offer similar customization, so there's no inherent advantage there either. The AF areas are very different between the cameras, and you do have to thoroughly learn them before you'll enjoy the full potential of either camera. And as a side note, this is something I cover in detail in my setup guides. Overall, I think the A1's AF system is a little bit easier to learn than the Nikon Z9, and you can often use different AF areas with equal amount of success for a given subject with that camera. On the other hand, I think the Z9 gives you more AF mode options, especially with the customizable wide AF areas. However, I also think the Z9 is a little more finicky about the user picking the best AF area for the situation in the viewfinder. The bottom line is that although I'd love to declare a winner here, so far in my usage with the current firmware, it's so close that it really doesn't matter. At one time, I would have told you that if you're looking for the best AF system, the A1 had the advantage. Now, from a practical standpoint with the current firmware, I think it's a toss-up. Systems. Finally, we have to consider the overall systems. The thing is, a camera body doesn't live in a void, and as the old saying goes, date the camera, marry the glass. 
Overall, in my opinion, for wildlife work, Nikon now has the advantage. While both companies offer exotic primes like the 4028 and the 600F4, Nikon is the one with built-in teleconverters. Although it's easy to dismiss a built-in TC as a minor luxury, in my experience with a 600F4 TC, it's more on the level of a game changer. I can't tell you the number of shots I've missed in the past because I either needed a TC, needed to take one off, or I was in the middle of adding or removing one. If you don't think the ability to have instant access to a TC is game changing, you probably haven't been doing wildlife for too long. In addition, Nikon offers the 800PF and the new 400 4.5. Both are lightweight, sharp, and handle incredibly well in the field. Sony has no answer for either lens. On the other hand, Sony does have the 200 to 600, while Nikon's is still on the roadmap with no hint of a release date. The 200 to 600 is far more affordable than any of the lenses mentioned previously. It's sharp and it's amazingly versatile. For many wildlife shooters, this is the only lens they need and it's readily available. The rest of Sony lenses are also easier to come by than most of the Nikon glass I mentioned, at least as of this video publication date. I'm sure that that will change in time and no longer be an issue. And the same goes for the Nikon 200 to 600. It'll be here eventually. Still, overall, I think that Nikon has a wider, more innovative selection of wildlife lenses than Sony and will really have things rounded out when the 200 to 600 is finally released. And I think that this is not an insignificant consideration. The truth is, I find myself reaching for my Z9 a bit more frequently than my A1, thanks to the glass. Plus, remember, there is an ocean of used F-mount glass that'll mount to your Z9 with an adapter. The winner is... So, as I said in the beginning, it's a tough call, and both cameras are fantastic performers. The truth is, if you're not getting the kind of shots you want with one brand, switching to the other isn't going to make a difference. The bottom line is that I'm happy with either camera in my hand. In some cases, the Z9 has an edge, in others, the A1 does, but the truth is, when taken as a whole, the advantages and disadvantages between the cameras really wash each other out, in my opinion. For what it's worth, my advice is if you already have Sony gear or Nikon gear, stick with it. I don't recommend switching brands. There's just not enough difference to justify it, not even close in my opinion. If you don't have a system and are undecided, that's when you really have to buckle down and consider the differences and think about what features are the most important to you in the field and which camera brings those to the table the best. If I had to choose between the two systems as of the publication date of this video, I think I would lean towards the Z9 by a hair. Although I do wish it was a little bit more customizable. In my opinion, Nikon's lens lineup is what tips the scales here. I can get pretty much any shot I want with either camera, but the TC lenses, the 800PF and the 404.5 are what really wins me over. However, if you're not thinking about dropping that kind of cash on glass, I can certainly see an argument for the incredible versatile and currently existing 200 to 600 Sony and the A1. You really can't go wrong either way. So which camera is your pick and why? Let me know in the comments. Remember, if you like this video, let me know by hitting that like and subscribe button. Have a great day.